All right, good evening. Welcome to my town hall meeting focused on, on North Core. So we do a, a series of these. Uh, in the past, obviously, we've done these in, in person. Um, prefer to do these types of meetings in person. We've often hosted them either at the Alfred Taylor Center or the town hall, which is where I'm currently sitting right now. Uh, on Roger Stevens. So this meeting, it's obviously uh, a webinar session on Zoom. So it's, it has a different format. Obviously, I'm the only one on camera. Um, there is the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. You should be able to see a Q&A. Also, there's the chat box, uh, which you can provide questions to me. I'm going to go through a presentation, a general presentation, and talk about just general things around the city and locally. And then I'm going to dive into a second presentation, which is more about uh, North Gore in the context of the secondary plan and development. Um, not that there's a lot, but you might be surprised to see just how much is possible um, through the secondary plan that was that was created in 2008 within the existing village boundary of, of North Gore. Um, I am recording this, so we record these. Uh, that's the other benefit of the, of the webinar is that I can record them and post them online. So if people aren't able to watch uh, tonight, they can go revisit it and we post them on our on our Team 21 uh, YouTube channel. So you can go back and, and watch this. Uh, so we'll, I'll go through the presentations, uh, answer any questions that come up, and then, um, and then we'll, we'll adjourn. Um, so anything that, uh, any questions that you have on, on what I'm presenting, on, on the secondary plan, on anything else, uh, feel free to populate those in the Q&A box. Uh, or the chat. The Q and A is a little bit a little bit easier to manage from my end. And if you see me pausing, and just because I'm reading something, I'm the only one that can see the questions. I'm the only one that can see the chat, um, and I'm the only one that can see the participants list. So um, all that stuff, whatever you put there, it's all just from you. And um, right, so we'll get we'll get into it. Um, thank you for joining me tonight. It's uh, nice to see a good number of familiar names on the list of attendees here. I did uh, the reason why I wanted to do this one because normally we would have hosted a series of midterm town halls in the fall of 2020. Um, I did it in the fall of 2012, the fall of 2016, and then obviously 2020 raised some some other issues which didn't enable me to be able to do what I normally would do. But coming into 2021 and realizing that we're still quite a bit, uh, we're still in this for quite a bit longer. I did want to somehow connect and and find a a good sort of topic to touch on. And what I noticed was that through our official plan review and some of the questions around the secondary plan, a lot of the questions I was getting was actually about the secondary plan in general, uh, not necessarily about changes to it, um, things that were established back in 2008 and that impact that could provide impacts in the future. So I thought it'd be good to sort of unpack that and, and sort of highlight exactly what, what that could be and what development could look like in, in the village. So we'll go through that. But first, we'll just touch on a couple of quick things in this presentation I have up on screen. So this is 2021 virtual town hall for North Gore. So mostly focused on North Gore, but we do talk about some city stuff. So first thing first, I always like to just kind of run through a quick a quick uh, summary of the things that I'm responsible for, the things that I, I do on council, committees I sit on, different things I sit on. So as you can see, I chair the city's environment committee. Last term, I was the chair of the agricultural affairs committee. I also sit on a variety of other committees, as you can see on your screen. I sit on the Ottawa Community uh, Housing Board of Directors, of which North Core uh, is the home to the only Ottawa Community Housing rural facility, Oak Ridge Apartments over in Roger Stevens, uh, in, the, in the city. Uh, I chair the Planning Advisory Committee. I sit on the Rehabilitation Conservation Authority. I sit on three business improvement areas in Mantic, the Carport Corridor one, and the one in Barhaven, because our ward goes slightly into Barhaven. And I sit on a variety of sponsors groups. So council in recent years has started to create uh, smaller groups of counselors that help advise things and work things through with staff. And they provide oversight as it works through the process before it finally comes back to council and uh, committee and council for a vote. And I sit on the sponsors groups for uh, the official plan, the transportation master plan, the climate change master plan, the solid master plan, and one that we just started up recently for uh, lands down it's not as involved. It's more talking about programming and what the future of Lansdowne could be uh, to better maximize that space. 
but that's not a very time consuming one. So move on to some city issues. Obviously the thing that dominates most of the time now is the our COVID-19 response and recovery. Um, if you get our e-newsletter, we try to provide as much information as possible uh, to residents on what's going on with COVID-19 um, from you know, obviously a city, a city management perspective, but also mainly from um, spread safety concern as well as the, the vaccination updates as to where that stands. And obviously more news on that, uh, that today with the age of the community clinics will be lowered to, lowered to 40 as of I believe Thursday and starting tomorrow and a lot more people can start to book their appointments, um, including uh, restaurant workers, which I know has been something that I hear about a lot from, from residents. So we also, I mentioned the official plan review uh, for just about two years now, we've been working on the official plan review. It's updated every, uh, it's supposed to be every five years or so. And sometimes it doesn't actually happen. The last time we did a review was actually 2013, but it dragged out in appeals and whatnot. So this is the first one that we're doing where there's actually an urban boundary. Uh, the last time an urban boundary expansion was considered was 2008. And that was, only a little bit of land, just um, the land that's currently being developed between Canada and Stittsville, and really nothing, nothing else at that time. Uh, the focus has been primar primarily on intensification, trying to build up more in the in the established communities uh, throughout the city, really inside the green belt, but also, oh, I'll give you an example. So, the urban boundary is proposed to be extended to Barnsdale Road. Uh, if it gets to Barnsdale Road, that essentially finishes Barhaven. Um, everything south of Barhaven is, is agricultural land, is prime agricultural land. So it's it's to be protected. At least that's our position, our current position. That's the position I've tried to, to push for is that we protect ag prime agricultural lands. So if that sticks, as it should, hopefully, future councils will, will be the determining factor on that one. Uh, Barhaven would then be bounded by the green belt to the north, the agricultural lands to the south, uh, just north of Manitick, 416 to the west, and the Rideau River to the east, which means future all future growth once it's built out will be through intensification in Barhaven too and you're starting to see some towers in Barhaven that'll be you know, that'll start to happen more in in communities like Barhaven and then also a bit more of a sort of a low-rise development in other communities which isn't easy but it's it's either that or we we keep on expanding and if you had caught some of the discussion around council back in the fall um, there has been you know some push by some councillors to include primary cultural lands in specifically Riverside South. And if once you do it there, once you start to say private cultural lands don't matter, um, they're secondary to development, to growth, then you're really gonna green light the potential expansion south of Stittsville and, and Canada, which is a huge concern in, in my mind. Um, because once you lose that land, you don't ever get it back uh, as we've seen locally in some degree. Uh, so that's, that's sort of the focus on the urban battery intensification discussion. Uh, village plans. There hasn't been really much on the on the village plan side of things. So we we reviewed our village plans back in the in 2012 as part of the 2013 official plan review. Uh, they were the direction was not to change any policies in, in in village plans, and that includes North Course Secondary Plan. Now, what people have seen and what people have noticed is that there's been a lot of, um, I guess, editorial changes uh, to the plan. All the policies really remain intact. Some of them um, might you know, be updated in terms of their wording, uh, but secondary plans are really supposed to be policy documents and they're supposed to be a very, very clear and concise policy documents. Whereas a lot of the older plans, um, even though it's only actually 13 years old, but a lot of the older plans do have a little bit more storytelling aspect. And I get there's some benefit to that. Uh, so just still working on that with, uh, I know working with the District Community Association, North Gore and city staff on exactly how we can refine that and where we can come to, to some sort of uh, common ground on that because city staff had gone, our planning staff had gone and, and cleaned it up. And it's not uncommon when we, when we did the official plan in 2013, um, we really changed, we really uh, didn't change it. We eliminated a lot of the sort of verbiage that didn't really have any bearing on the actual policies. So the policies themselves are in place for North Gore, but a lot of the like one full page of just you know, just words that weren't actually policies was was removed and and it looks like change and that's kind of something that we need to do better with uh, communicating because uh, it's hard to go tell people that it didn't change then you find a, a plan that's four thousand words where it used to be eight thousand words uh, so still working on that 
with the community. And today, I'm not going to necessarily focus on that so much as the just the existing plan and then what its impact is. Uh, climate change master plan, solid waste master plan. Um, so climate change master plan we approved uh, January 2020. And then we approved a, another follow up follow up to that in the fall of 2020, where it's sort of the implementation process to get to uh, net zero by 2050 for the city of Ottawa. So always master plan is ongoing. We actually have a big meeting coming up in June at the Environment Committee where we'll get phase two of our always master plan. That's going to cover sort of all aspects of waste about where we're going with this. So, you know, things with collection, things with, you know, waste diversion, um, the future of the landfill, you know, what options are there to, to, you know, extend the life of the landfill, what options are there to process waste in a different manner. Um, we're going to look at everything. Everything is on the table and it's going to be presented to committee in in June and then go out for public consultation on that throughout the summer and fall. So keep an eye on that. It actually isn't going to finish up until early 2023, uh, but we, we do want to work on that this year and then into 2022. Uh, the ward boundary review, this is something that doesn't obviously impact North Core a whole ton. Uh, the ward boundary is really just looking at, in the urban area, it's about population shift. So it's about making sure that the, the wards have an equal population in a ward like Kitchissippi has grown exponentially where it's going to be about 20,000 more than neighboring Bay wards. So we have some shifts in the lines there. For Ward 21, um, it's really just moving the Stittsville out, moving a bit of Barhaven. So those parts of the urban area that have grown into our ward have have um, sort of been shifted over into the the existing ward, uh, so the, the the adjacent ward. Sorry, um, so the area you know directly north of Fluellen that's that's growing. Uh, it's it's you know it's obviously adjacent to just Stittsville it goes into Stittsville ward, Barhaven ward. Actually, there's going to be a new Barhaven ward. So right now we have 23 wards. It's going to be 24 wards. Uh, Barhaven gets split in two. Riverside South and Finley Creek become their own ward. And that's obviously because of the growth that's going on. Uh, in that area. And all this goes into to effect for the 2022 um, election. Um, so just have a question in the in the box here, because it's on this page, it fits into the official plan review aspect. So it talks about a one kilometer, one kilometer boundary around villages. Um, just a question about how that works and what's the purpose and what are the rules. So there's two there's two parts to that. A one kilometer boundary has always existed around villages. Um, and that's to allow them to grow. So there's that there's that element that's the one that's that's always been existing. It's so that we don't put sort of sparse development right up against a village boundary, and then in the future when that boundary needs when that village you know, kind of starts bursting at the seams and it needs to grow, there's actually nowhere for it to grow. Um, in the rural area, that's not always easy because a lot of our areas is actually agricultural land, so it's not a place that we'd want to grow in the first place. Uh, but that policy was there, and that's always been there, and that just stays there. The, the one kilometer boundary that would have been discussed recently was more to protect villages from encroachment of that urban boundary. So in, in terms of the current urban boundary that really only comes into play for Manitic and Navin pretty much because they're really close to that, that boundary currently and Cumberland to a degree as well. But, um, you know, again, communities like Richmond, North Core, they're quite far removed from the urban boundary. Uh, so it doesn't really have a have a, a significant role here, but it's really to sort of create that that buffer to make sure that a rural village like Manitic, obviously it's less rural than it, than it was years ago, but that it doesn't actually just blend right into Barhaven. So Barhaven doesn't, I mentioned earlier, trying to draw that line at Barnsdale Road, making sure you're protecting the agricultural land north of Bankfield Road, and then you create that, that buffer is right there. So the one kilometer boundary just kind of embeds it in the official plan in in our mapping exercises when it comes to looking at urban boundary expansion, but protecting the agricultural land is actually really what drives it home and actually gets that gets that done. Um, question also about the ward boundary review and possible reduction of rural wards. Uh, that was, that was, I mean, I mentioned that the ward boundary review resulted in an increase in wards. Uh, so the ward, again, the ward count come 2022 will be 24 wards as opposed to uh, 23. And the reason for that is again population growth and and uh, fair representation across the city doesn't always work because the rural wards are so so less populated than the urban wards and the rural wards are much bigger every single urban ward all 19 of them fit inside uh, our ward 21 uh, but clearly there's only 
you know, there's only so many people here, 30,000 residents in, in Rita Wilburn and uh, uh, many more in, in the, in the, right now there's 60,000 in the Barhaven ward. So that's why that one's being changed too. And that's why they're adding the ward. So I'm going to move on just quickly to, I don't want to spend too much time on this stuff because I want to talk more about the local stuff, but on the budget. So what you see here in this slide is the revenue, what's coming into the city for 2021 in our 2021 budget. Uh, it's a $3.94 billion budget this year. Uh, you see, obviously, almost half of the money comes in through property taxes, and there's a variety of other sources. And some of these sources offset what you see on the next graph, which is the expenditures. And the one, the, the key one here is when I go back to this, to this chart, you see the, the transfers from the federal and provincial government. A lot of that money is actually dedicated towards community services that uh, the city must operate, they must run. And the province provides that money and prescribes it and it fits into that community and social services bundle here, which is $746 million annually. So when we look at, uh, then you look at the rest of it too. So you see, you know, police services, water, sewer, solid waste. Let's see, no one in um, North Gore is paying into the water and sewer budget, uh, but the parks and rec and the different things, emergency services. Uh, so you see it there and that's sort of what's, you know, that's the expenditures versus the, the revenues. Um, budgets, I see a question there about agricultural lands and how it relays, relates to the distribution center. I will touch on that in the presentation later on. So budget 2021, maintain services, consistent budget. That's sort of the, the focus of this one. We do have the money coming in with Ontario Safe Restart to make sure that we can uh, continue on the budget and not have too many cuts throughout how we operate the city of Ottawa through this time, because there's a lot of things that we do that still need to be done. Uh, for instance, renewal, um, parks, roads, buildings, all these things, they still need commitment, they still need funding. And that's this budget does that with another focus uh, on housing and emergency services. So putting more into emergency services and also more money into housing, affordable housing across the city. So moving forward, just on to, on to some local issues. Um, local park projects. I know this one, the first one I've listed here, Alfred Taylor Center, that's not something that's currently involving the city, but I know the community, uh, there's a community group that is heavily involved with, with you know, coming up with a, an improvement plan, um, increased amenities at Alfred Taylor Rec Center, which I'm happy to support in any way I can as that plan gets developed and, and they seek funding opportunities uh, to be able to implement that. A federal program was just announced recently um, with that includes some funding for smaller parks across the city. It's a five-year project, so it's it's phased in. And Meadowbrook Park um, in the community, just off of Prince of Wales, their park there, their structure will be renewed, but I think it's actually slated for 2023. It's, again, it's a five-year plan, so there's a variety of projects, I think it's 30 projects citywide, but um, we have actually three of the 30 projects are in, are in Ward 21, and one of them is here in North Core. The other ones are in Mantic and Munster. Uh, Fair Mile Park I've listed here, obviously just south of, of North Gore. That's something that we've been working on in my office and has been working on for a few years. Fair Mile doesn't have a park. You know, they have park land, but they don't really have a park. So we've been working on a plan to implement a, to install a play structure, make it a bit more family friendly in that, in that area, because their only access to a park right now is across on, on Fairhurst, across Donnelly Drive. So this will make it a bit safer for them. Uh, paid for out of our cash in lieu of park land account that we have. Uh, in the ward. So infrastructure projects, I've listed a uh, Church Street Bridge, really only listing this just to thank people for their patience when that was um, under construction and, and Church Street was closed uh, for the length of time that it was. So obviously appreciate the, you know, the, that people needed to sort of find a different way to get around the village. Um, I think the residents on Church Street and off of Church Street <laughs> were quite appreciative of the closure because it was pretty quiet for a little while. Um, so there's nothing in the budget this year that is directly surrounding uh, North Core. There are upcoming projects. So renewal of Pollock Road, a second line road is going to be upgraded. So between uh, Roger Stevens and Century, it's going to be upgraded to a hard surface within the next one to two years. Uh, McCordick Road, McCordick Road is actually covered in a bunch of sections, but the, the main section that's in the roughest shape right now is between Church Street and Roger Stevens and it's to be uh, renewed within the next two to three years, as is the section of Malakoff Road south of Cowell, 
which if you've been down it, you can just pick pieces of the road out. It's in such rough shape. It's pretty much where Donnelly was about 10 years ago. Um, so those are the infrastructure projects that are coming up. Those are those will be in future budgets as we as we you know move forward. And then briefly, I just did, I'm gonna talk about in a bit about um, that our office does a podcast now. We we try to keep find you know new ways to keep people updated and in our one of our most our most recent episode actually we did a podcast on the cranberry creek it was really on municipal drainage in, in total there's 700 municipal drains throughout the city of ottawa obviously cranberry creek is a fairly significant one in in our area with a number of people 300 residents in the 300 properties within the watershed uh, so it's something that generated a lot of interest and discussion in recent years um, background started in 2013 with some flooding and stemmed into a, a report for uh, an upgrade to the to the municipal drain that exists there. Uh, so went through a number of steps and uh, the various uh, approval and appeal stages of that of that project. Eventually, the report was appealed to the drainage tribunal. So Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. They're the ones that really have oversight over municipal drainage through the Drainage Act. The city acts as sort of the facilitator and the maintenance. They're responsible for the municipalities are responsible for the maintenance of municipal drains, but the municipal drains are actually owned by private residents who uh, are benefit who, whose water runs into that municipal drain. So the tribunal uh, set aside the report that was um, that was you know obviously controversial in, in our community, and the next steps to that are the tribunal recommended bringing the engineer back in. Here's, here's a number of things in their decision that you should consider and you know go back and, and review those and see what else is possible to address those concerns. The nice thing was that in the, the steps that we took along the way, we reduced costs, we, not costs, sorry, we reduced the assessment for many of the residents. Um, the, when, when a report gets set aside and an engineer gets appointed again, everything, all the steps prior, all go by the wayside. So whatever decision the court of revision would have made on Cranberry Creek, it all it all falls apart. But the tribunal did suggest to take those things into consideration in doing the in revisiting the report and coming back with the report. So that's that's a positive. So we'll see where that goes. The city still has to appoint an engineer again uh, to go back to that and to to start not start that process again, but sort of see it to the to the finish. Because right now it's 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 kind of in limbo. And it can't be just nothing. Oh, I went away from my thing. Oh, geez. Sorry about this. So I mentioned the the podcast. This is just some things on communication side of things. Um, trying to find ways to, as I said, we obviously can't meet in person on a number of these items. Um, so we still do a lot of our information through the websites, uh, which is team21.ca, social media, our newspaper columns, um, which don't really well know the messenger messenger comes so a community voice is more in the Goulburn side of things mix messenger uh, does service Goulburn but also has been a long-standing newspaper here in the Rio area uh, so we started the podcast last year so we've done a number of episodes on that you can find it on any it's just called uh, Scott Moffat's 21 podcast and you can find it on any uh, and wherever you listen to podcasts you can find it and we just touch on a number of local issues and we have, I think we've done about 30 episodes so far, maybe more than that. Uh, our e-newsletter, we've bumped it up to weekly. So it, as I mentioned at the start, it has up-to-date info on, on COVID, the response and how you can get information about that. And then we put our columns in there and any relevant information that to keep residents updated as much as possible. So from that, just wanna always put this in every one of my presentations. Uh, one of the biggest issues that we hear about all the time is speeding. Um, so online reporting, that's the main, that's, that's where auto police want you to go. They want you to report online. It's autopolice.ca slash online reporting. Uh, that's how they generate their reports. That's how they deploy their enforcement is through their online reports. When you go to autopolice.ca, you see the main page. This is what comes up. Um, you just click on that online reporting link and it will send you through some steps. I've gone and reported a few things in my time. It's fairly easy. It does say it's fast and easy. That's not a lie. And then just my contact info. So I'll leave it up for just a couple of seconds, uh, just in case you want to write anything down. Uh, our Twitter accounts there, my personal one, which is really just my personal Twitter account, but our our, our office Twitter account is uh, Team Twenty One, and then our website Team Twenty One .ca, and my email address Scott.Moffat at Ottawa.ca. Important to note, I mean, if there's anything that I you know I touch on today that 
that you have a question on that maybe I don't touch on that maybe I don't ask answer properly, you know, obviously send me an email, scott.moffat.ca it comes to me directly, but it also, uh, my whole team sees that too. So, um, you know, we chop it, we try to get back to people, try to get back to people as quick as possible. It doesn't always, doesn't always happen. So that's that presentation. Um, I, I'm just going to close this off for a second and then I will get you to the next one. Hey, there we go. Stop sharing my screen for a sec. And then just bear with me while I transition to the next presentation. All right, so what you're seeing now is a map of North Core, obviously. And I'm sorry, I'm just trying to reopen my box for a sec. Just bear with me here. All right. Okay, so this is where I wanted to walk through um, just about the boundary of, of North Core. Uh, in the context of development and, and what's sort of prescribed in the secondary plan and then how that relates to the zoning. Uh, so what you see, uh, the, the red outline and then the, the yellow, the shaded yellow area, that's the existing North Core village boundary. And it was adjusted slightly in 2008 when the secondary plan was, was, was approved. Now, interestingly, if you actually go through some of the history on the North Core secondary plan in 2008, there were some suggestions to expand the boundary further uh, to include Stratton. So on the north side, you can just kind of see the edge of the boundary. Stratton is up here between Prince of Wales and Third Line. That would have brought uh, that street, that corner into the, into the village boundary, uh, squaring off at Third Line Road. So bringing all these lands into the village boundary and then actually extending. You can see here, so in the, I'm going to focus on this in a bit, but the lands directly west of, of Craighurst are actually in the village boundary. It goes halfway through this field. There was some discussion in 2008 of extending it all the way up to McCordick. That was set aside because it was determined, first of all, the community pushed back on the idea. Um, but what I have around this village right now is the overlay is the Lear. So it's the land evaluation area review. It's the soils qualities for the land around North Corp. The darker, the color, so the darker the brown, uh, the better the soils. So you can see directly west of, of the village boundary is actually quite prime agricultural land. So that's why you wouldn't want to go in that direction. Uh, you see the lands south of the village, north of the village. Um, there are quite decent lands around the village boundary. You know, I'll touch on that question right now from that I see here on the chat box. These lands here where the industrial lands are, they were included in the village boundary in 2008. They weren't previously. Uh, so that way they could put some policies over top of them. But the lands themselves haven't been agriculturally designated since, since the 1990s. They were designated agricultural. They were really no different than the lands um, surrounding them in all directions, except for obviously the village, in that they were designated agricultural back then. But the municipality at that time changed the designation from agricultural to industrial and commercial, highly commercial, of course. Um, right then and there, it's done. I mean, once you once you change the agricultural designation, yes, the lands can remain can can be farmed for years to come, but the opportunity for development does exist. Um, so even in even in the village, and that's kind of the point of going through this. There's a lot of farmland in this village that is actually designated for development, and it's important to walk through that and to understand that because it will come up, and maybe not tomorrow, maybe not in 10, 15 years, but at some point, the opportunity could come up because. We have, at the city, we have um, the Rural Residential Land Survey. So it shows the total number of lots, of units available, the potential unit uh, build out for every community. Now, North Gore is not one of the communities identified for, for significant growth over the next 30 years um, and beyond. Those communities are really Greeley, Manatech, Richmond, and Carp. Uh, North Gore sort of falls into a secondary category, secondary subset of of rural communities and that they'll see you know modest growth you know no, essentially what you've seen in the last 20 years is what you'll continue to see 
you know, the, the development across directly across the road from me, Maple Forest Estates. That's a good example of what the type of pace of growth that you'll see in the village of North Gore, because it's not on it's not municipal services. Everything's built on well and septic, so it's not something that we, that the city, looks to uh, to you know to grow significantly in the coming years. But I will go through. So here's obviously your village just taking away that overlay, taking away the boundary, and taking away the agricultural um, the agricultural piece. And just looking at the communities in general, I'm going to sort of run through a few. I'm not going to cover everything. I'm not going to run through a few areas that have come up in questions from residents and just things that you know it's important to know. Um, so first things first, zoom in over here. That's uh, Dr. Blair, Craighurst. It's a little bit blurry, so I'll just add this overlay. Uh, so you see here's the lots, and here's the of the two. The two you see the parks, Craighurst and Edward Craig Park. That land that you're looking at, that's all within the village boundary. Um, but it's all currently farmed. So as long as it's farmed, as long as the owner owns it, um, then it remains as is. But when you look at the secondary plan, these lands are all zoned village residential, which means it can grow to the same extent that you see at Craighurst and, and Dr. Blair. Um, the entire area can grow, except for where the floodplain is. I don't have the floodplain map uh, lined up on this map, but I do want a couple more coming up. But I do want to touch on this because this one came up a few times in emails. I know I think there was a conversation on Facebook about this too, about pathways. The secondary plan that the community approved, the community you know, came together, drafted a secondary plan led by the community. What they identified was a, a parks and pathway plan. And it's so that when growth occurs, they want to know where the roads are going to be, where the pathways are going to be. They want to set that so they can create a Know, can, a nice, uh, some nice continuity for pathways in the village. Uh, so you do that through a secondary plan. Secondary plans drive growth. They, they, they predict where growth will be and they help guide it in terms of the zoning and then also the site plan process. So when a development application comes forward, a draft plan subdivision, how that's going to look, how that's going to fit into the village, they go to the secondary plan to figure that out and to find the best way, you know, it's this is the document, the visioning document that enables that development to happen in concert with what the community had suggested. So in this case up here, you see this is the piece that comes in the secondary plan. So you can see obviously Craighurst and you see Dr. Blair and all the land in between. So the shaded lands, the, the lands that are that sort of yellowish color are all within the village boundary and could all be developed uh, whenever an application wanted to come in. Um, it identifies that the black dotted line is identified as a future road. So it would connect that community with Roger Stevens and fourth line road. The gray dotted lines are your preferred pathways. So the community decided they wanted to see pathway connections. They wanted to see the parks connect. They want to see easy access around the village in the future should lands be developed. Again, this is all based on if if the owner of those lands wants to farm them for the next 300 years, they will be farmed for the next 300 years. This is just an if document and it provides that guidance. Should something happen, this is how it, this is how the community determined they wanted it to happen. So those gray lines showing the pathways, um, that's just there as a placeholder uh, should any applications come forward. And then the developer of that day would be required to adhere to this plan and provide those pathway connections in these areas. So I'm going to move on to uh, Church Street. You've seen a lot of growth recently on Church Street. Um, a lot of Church Street is within the, the village boundary. And I'll just give you the zoning. So now I'm just showing you the zoning map, not necessarily the, the previous uh, secondary plan overlay, but the actual you know, in-place zoning today. So the blue hashed area, that's the floodplain. No growth can occur in the floodplain. You cannot build in the floodplain at all. So the floodplain is kind of what makes North Gore you know, disconnected as it is today. Floodplain exists all throughout the various uh, corners of North Core, which is what keeps that separation from certain areas. You know, you see the, the new development to Ralph Jago Way. Ralph Jago is, is all that land in between Ralph Jago and the village proper. That's all floodplain, so cannot be developed. Um, same with down here. So where the new lots are, you see there's three of them here on the map, if you can see my cursor, hopefully. And then there's more that's all filled in on either side of Church Street. Now, what's been 
what's been left behind are little road allowances to get into, let's say, this land here, uh, just skirting the floodplain, you could actually put lots back here. Uh, you could put a little subdivision off of Church Street, a road in here, and you could put lots back in here. That is permitted. Is the landowner doing that anytime soon? Likely not. It's the same over on, on Roger Stevens. So you have the pub and you have the two homes next to the pub. There is an application and there was an application. I can't remember exactly where, what, where it ended up, but it was to create two severed lots on Roger Stevens adjacent to the two existing homes. So they would come here and here. Now the city actually took a bit of exception with those two, with that lot creation, because what the city would have suggested was wait on this, don't do these two lots now, wait to do an actual plan of subdivision so that there's some sort of continuity and consistency with the, with the drainage plan for the community, for, for, that, for that area. Because right now, just two lots, you can come into some grading and drainage plans. The two existing lots there are much, are much lower than what a new lot would be. Um, a new owner does have to adhere to, uh, to the drainage rules and whatnot, and they can't drain out onto other properties but it can get a little bit difficult and it would have been much easier um, from a planning perspective if this whole area had been done at once, not that it had to be done now. So, but what, what, what has happened is that the owner of the land has applied for two new lots fronting onto Roger Stevens. The land in behind can be developed at some point as can the land across the road, which we talked about already uh, adjacent to the Craker subdivision, all that land not in the floodplain and that can be developed in the future but again, it's all owned by farmers right now. It's all actively being farmed. So I don't expect this to happen anytime soon. Similarly, we jump across Church Street, the land behind the row of new homes. It's all being farmed at the moment. But as you, this red line that I'm showing you here, that's all that V1P, it's that village residential zone. So this land can be developed similar to how you see Farmstead Ridge. One of the frustrating things in, in North Core, and this comes up in in Farmstead Ridge quite often is that there's no actual connection. There's no pathway connection and it's tough because you make people walk on Church Street. Um, what would have been, I mean, hindsight is 2020, but what would have been ideal is that a pathway opportunity existed onto Farmstead Ridge and that if new development happened here, you could connect a pathway, not a road, but a pathway to provide that pedestrian connection so that everyone's not walking on Church Street. Because we don't, all none of these roads are built for for subdivision type or residential development. They're all just, you know, old, older roads that have you know, their narrow road allowances. They have ditches. They're very difficult to make. Um, you know, you can't really create an urban cross section of some of these roads. So we often see requests for sidewalks. We, you know, we did the, the paved shoulder over on, on Roger Stevens recently to sort of allow something for Craighurst into the village to connect to that sidewalk that sort of ends at Oak Ridge, the Oak Ridge apartments. Uh, but it's not perfect, right? And you're trying to, you're sort of trying to square a lot of um, circles when it comes to planning in a in an established community with some of the newer the newer standards that you'd like to see. So that's on that side of things. You can see where the development is possible. Not that it's actually going to happen anytime soon, but it is possible there. So we move over from here uh, to just south of the south side of the village, and again, you see that floodplain line run through. Um, you see behind Lanida and Garmel and Carolyn Court, there's some land that's really landlocked. So that's really nothing happening there. But the land south of that, again, all actively farmed, all owned by a, a local farmer. Uh, that land is all actually in the, in the village boundary. Uh, so much of that land is inside the village boundary. Well, it, all, it all is, this whole parcel. Uh, but it's mostly, a lot of it is, is you know, impacted by the floodplain. Uh, so you can't build in that, that area. What could happen, I will just tell, tell you straight up, what could happen is because this land can't be developed, landowners could get together and do a cut and fill. And we see this often where they, they take land that isn't floodplain, they make it floodplain to reduce the floodplain elsewhere. So in reality, these landowners, and again, just saying what's possible, not what's actually happening. These landowners could come together, reduce the floodplain impact down here, shift it over here and move around some of the lands in order to maximize development uh, possibilities. But as, as you can see, floodplain, as I mentioned, does play a significant role in the village of North Core in terms of its planning and its growth potential, um, as does agriculture, because everything I'm showing you right now is all actively farmed. So it's in the village boundary, but actively farmed. 
and we move up uh, to the north side again more farmland um, but inside the village boundary the floodplain in this case stevens creek it does form the boundary for the village so the the, the land along stevens creek on the on the east side is all outside the village boundary of north gore uh, but you do see a lot of land between prince of wales behind michelangelo and russ fern all that land is inside the village boundary as well and can all be in the future uh, developed. The land, I didn't include it on this, but the land across, so the land between, let's say the Wesleyan Church and Meadowbrook subdivision, that too has some development potential. I'd say about 60% of that land, 67% is actually floodplain, um, but there are some pieces that could see development off of, off of Prince of Wales, but it's, um, it's not much of it. I'll, again, it's, it's really encumbered by the, by the floodplain mapping in that area. So I'm going to move over to the industrial land uh, just to show you the, the zoning and then to touch on that, to touch on that, uh, that Lear thing I mentioned earlier, the agricultural issue I mentioned, just to, just to zone right in on it so that you can see it up close. So this mapping, which surprised me a bit, this mapping has actually been updated. Um, this is the approved zoning from, from 2019. It's subject to appeal, so it's not, uh, it's not in action, it's not active. No one can do anything according to the zoning, but this is the zoning that was approved. So it was, and the reason why I know is because this line right here. So this piece right here along, there's a large hill here and it's treed, that width is hundred meters. So when, when council approved the plan for the industrial lands, one of the things that we put in place was a hundred meter setback, a zone setback. So this is actually a open space zone. It's the same zone that we apply to parks. You can't build in that area. Uh, so that, that zoning is there. Um, the rest of the site is a zoned previously, prior to the application, it zoned a combination of industrial and highway commercial. Uh, the setback would have been 15 meters from all the property edges. It's about 120 acre site. Uh, the proposed development, which we don't no 100% yet because there's no actual site plan application um, is for uh, would have would have taken up the 15 to 20% of the property. One of the things I do want to mention, so this is this is changing too here. So this floodplain, there is updated floodplain mapping coming for North Core, which is going to impact this property and other properties in in and around North Core. In recent years, you've probably seen recent in the last year, you've probably seen a lot of fill coming into certain areas of North Core. That's because floodplain mapping is coming. And as long as floodplain mapping isn't in place, uh, you, can, you can add fill. Once floodplain mapping is in place for your lands, you can't add fill. Um, it's a bit of land manipulation, but it's not uncommon. Um, so what happened here is what's gonna happen here is that you'll see this floodplain here will likely be altered in some way. And they'll have to, if, this, if the plan for these lands goes forward, Again, subject to appeal. Everything I'm saying is hypothetical based on that. Um, they would have to adhere to the new floodplain mapping, and they'd have to adhere to the the zoning. And one, the only other thing I want to touch on this from a zoning perspective is when council approved the zoning. So the existing zoning on this property that's been in place since the '90s permitted. It was the idea at the time was a a industrial commercial park business park. Um, so you know, in the line of 30 to 40 buildings, smaller buildings, but some bigger buildings, bigger buildings would have been permitted in here as well. Um, but generally an idea as what you see up off of Carp Road. So Carp and, and Highway 417, the Oz Dome's in there, and the Waste man Management has a site in there. There's a number of other buildings in there. The City of Ottawa has a snow dump, a snow disposal facility in there as well. Uh, that's the type of development that was originally foreseen for this. So there's with that, there's a certain size of building that can be permitted uh, there's setbacks there's all these different things to consider and one of the concerns there was actually a neighbor that really brought it to my attention was this notion that if you go if you allow height to increase then all the buildings can allow their height to increase so what we what we came up with is a volume based zoning so most zoning is based on on footprint it's what footprint you can cover so if you had an increase in height the increase in height would be impacted on the entire site so you could build up everywhere. Now all of a sudden you have, you know, a site with the potential here 
had if things go through is that you could have had if things went through based on the original application sorry you could add two buildings two large waste just uh, waste sorry uh, distribution centers on the site and waste disposal facility in my head and so what we did was we looked at the the total permitted floor space under the previous zoning and said okay if you want to go higher you need to give us something so in this case we did it based on volume. So what's the max volume for the previous zoning based on 15 meters and 11 meters for all the buildings? And it was 1.9 million cubic meters. So in a 22 meter building, that's 700,000 square feet, if that's what they propose, if that's what they actually come forward with and wanted to build here, that would take up 1.4 million cubic meters of the zoning space. So the only permitted space left over would be 500,000 cubic meters of space. And just to give some perspective to that, the Bell Sensplex in Canada is about 250,000 cubic meters of volume. So it just gives you an idea that we didn't just wanna, you know, based on all the concerns that we did here, we wanna try to do something. I didn't just wanna take the application that was sent forward and just vote it down and then have that go to appeal. And then the community's fighting the existing plan that the, that Broccolini put forward. And if the community loses, it's that existing plan with, you know, again, the 15 meter setback, uh, the ability to grow taller and wider. Um, we want to try to address some of those concerns as best as possible. And I have no role in the appeal process. That's once set of, once it's gone through city, vote for, vote against. Once it's gone through the city, I have no more role. Um, but I do have a role when it comes to when it comes to committee and council. And I can impose things. On, on the approved application. If I vote against it, I can't, I can't change a thing. Uh, so that's what we did there. We added a few pieces. We tried to address the long-term, uh, the long-term impacts of that property, regardless of what happens. And, and if the community, if the community is successful in their appeal, the community group that is appealing it, it goes back to that existing zoning. So that existing 1997 vision um, you know, the things that we added are, are gone, but that's, you know, it goes back to that original vision, then you start from scratch. Um, if the community isn't successful in the appeal, then what's put in place is at least that amended zoning. That's sort of the idea. The question here, just could the city not address those issues via the site plan process? No. Uh, the issues that we put in place at the zoning uh, could not be addressed in site plan. Uh, you have no authority to impact, to impose a setback through site plan. Um, Many of the concerns, so traffic, uh, lighting, you know, the, the, the layout of the site, those things are addressed through site plan. Uh, but the zoning is specific and the zoning was already in place for this site. So the secondary plan didn't have a role necessarily in this site because one of the things, if you read the old secondary plan, every, every secondary plan, every official plan, they'll all have a section at the end which says implementation. If you don't implement your secondary plan, if you don't change the zoning to adhere to your new plan, the zoning in place is what takes precedence. And that's what happened on this site, is that whatever was zoned in the 1990s is what mattered today. The secondary plan said a few things, tried to change some things as to how this plan would be developed, but ultimately wasn't prescribed in the zoning, and the zoning is what took precedence. That's likely going to come out through the uh, through the appeal process, but that's just where that stands. And the other reason I wanted to highlight it right now is because one of the other concerns was if something happens here, the likelihood is it's going to happen in the other four, the other three corners. Now, if you see, you can see the floodplain on this on the screen. So two of the corners are are covered in the floodplain, but I go to the next, and now you see the 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 Lear overlay. Um, so this is the, the land, all of these properties save this one um, lighter color directly south of the property. They all score between 150 and 160. Uh, the highest Lear score that we really have in the city is around 175. The threshold for primary agriculture land is 125. So these lands score quite high. Now we have people that come to council and they suggest, well, you should just you should just create a swath two kilometers wide, the whole length of the 416 and allow for industrial development. Maximize the 416. The guy that said that is an idiot 
because the land along the 416 is either the green belt or it's prime agricultural land. There's only a few slivers of land up near, up near Moody Drive. So Moody, Fallowfield, just on the edge of Barhaven, which could see some growth. But the Bankfield intersection is covered in agricultural land. The Roger Stevens intersection is covered in agricultural land. The Dilworth one is mostly floodplain. Uh, so you, you can only do so much down there. Um, but here in this case, if this land was never changed in 1997, this land won't, uh, this land wouldn't be here. It wouldn't be a question today. If this land hadn't, if this land was still agriculturally zoned today, there'd be no changing it today. Um, so that's, 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 that goes for the other three corners at this intersection. Might not be what the landowners at the intersection want to hear, uh, but ultimately that's, that's the reality. Um, again, it's all subject to future council policy and it's all subject to future councils that might take a different position. Um, I had to fight tooth and nail on, on just protecting hundred hectares of land in, in Riverside South, which could have ballooned to 700 hectares over the next 15, 20, 30 years. Uh, so we'll see where that goes. That conversation is going to come back. And, but ultimately, if we put strong policies in place today to protect agricultural lands, then those should stand. And the province has similar, has similar rules about agricultural lands and protecting those. So again, you know what, just closing this off, North Core is not a community identified in any plan for significant growth. Uh, we're not looking at any boundary expansion in the village of North Core for the foreseeable future because it's just not needed. And I'll go to the next slide, which is just sort of the last one. And this is just that rural land, that rural residential land survey that I mentioned earlier um, that shows the lot capacity. It's not the greatest coloring because it's only a little bit darker than white. But all those shaded areas, those shaded sort of yellow areas, those are all the areas where, where growth could occur in North Gordon. They're also all currently farmed. So the only area that has a, has a subdivision approval in this entire map is that one that's more of an orange color. It's identified as NG45. That's the final phasing for the Maple Forest subdivision that brings it into Alfred Taylor, the Alfred Taylor Rec Center in that area coming down uh, behind Relin Way. That's the only land I mean, as of 2018, I think the number was there were 70 lots available uh, approved in North Core, but there are 470 units potential in North Core. But all of those units sit on, all those units would, would essentially sit on lands that are currently farmed. Um, so it's not, you know, it's there, the capacity is there, the potential is there, uh, but the plans aren't and the, the desire isn't there from the landowners and even it's not assumed from the city that that growth would occur anytime soon. So that's it for the presentation. It probably, I probably talked longer than you wanted me to. Um, I'm just going to close that. Just move some stuff around here so I can see the screen. So just looking at the chat box already, there were four questions that were asked in the series that I answered during the uh, during the time, um, but if anyone has any more questions, um, any questions at all about anything that you've heard here today, um, you know, by all means, I'm happy to I'm happy to uh, to answer those. Um, ultimately, today was you know today was supposed to be just about providing some information about that, and I think. You know, back in 2019, when we were talking about the industrial lands and the potential there and what was going on, uh, what became clear is that, is that it's not well known. Um, you know, zoning in, in North Core and development potential in North Core is not well known because it's not that active. So it's, um, it's just something that has to be considered. And I thought having a meeting, I think it was actually suggested by a resident back then that we do something like this and just didn't do it. And then next thing you know, it was COVID. So, um, yeah, so appreciate the opportunity here to talk about this um, question, just a couple questions. So do I know when the new floodplain mapping will be out? I do not know that. Um, I'm happy to, I know obviously now who asked that question and uh, I can find out, I can find out for you. Sorry, just bear with me as I'm going to write that down. Um, 
find out, obviously, I sit on the Revive Conservation Authority board, and that is who provides the oversight for, for the mapping, the mapping updates. I don't expect it to be too, change, too, too uh, impactful, the change, uh, but it still happens. Um, when it was done in cars, they actually reduced the floodplain. Uh, it was reduced by about a foot in most areas, just because the new data was so much better than what was done previously. So question, uh, with the anticipated growth, North Core will need a larger grocery store, doctor's office, other essential services. Uh, there will be nowhere for these facilities to go if a mega distribution center uses up the Jordan Lakers property. It is not compatible with the rural heritage character. Okay, so the secondary plan also speaks to that. The secondary plan speaks to doctor's office, essential services, grocery store services, retail services. It does not suggest they be out at the 416 at Roger Stevens. It actually suggests they be in the court. So the secondary plan is quite clear on that. In fact, a plaza is a prohibited use. A retail plaza is a prohibited use in the industrial lands at Roger Stevens and 416. So that's not where the land, that's not where that type of development is, is prescribed in your secondary plan. Um, another question, is there any future development near 416 Brophy exit? No, just straight no. Um, there is, there's always some people that kick tires on the land directly south of Barnsdale Road uh, on the west side. So between Moody Drive and William McEwen, as you come down from Barnsdale, those lands are all zoned general rural. I've had countless tire kickers on lands up there, but you have no connection to services up there. Um, the viability, people think that because it's close to Barhaven, oh, well, I'll just service it from Barhaven. Well, we have a servicing boundary. You can't service outside of, a, outside of the urban boundary. So you can't bring services across the 416 and service lands south of Barnsdale Road along Moody. Um, there is, you know, the, there's been talk for 15 years about the a lot of water development. And that's, I mean, the owner of that still wants to do it. But ultimately, there's nothing. There's nothing going on there. Just a question about there's no services here either. That's right. Um, but it's a different type of development. So when I when I'm talking about south of Barnsdale, what I've heard, I've had someone uh, pitch an idea where they wanted to build a church and a community center and a hotel and a bunch of housing. Okay, so like high density housing and retirement residences. Uh, that's something that needs servicing. Um, there are there's plenty of potential for development in the rural area on private services. I mean, we've all, you know, spent years out here of our lives on private services. Um, growth can occur on private services. It's just not to the same extent that we see elsewhere. But the reality is that that site, that original plan in 1997 could be built today, fully on private services. Um, well, in septics for, you know, 30 to 40 properties in the industrial lands that could be built today on private. It doesn't require um, in fact, the Carp Road one, only half of it is serviced by water. Uh, none of it has sewer. It's, it's, it's all on, it's all on uh, private services, except for the few properties that got water. And that was only because of a landfill contamination. So just working through some of the questions here. Uh, another question about how can we find out if developers are coming into town and buying a property? I don't have the information. So we don't, we don't know. I mean, um, interestingly enough, the, you know, in, in the 1990s, uh, Minto was actually buying up the lands in Manitick, um, unbeknownst to most people. And then come 10 years later, they applied for a development application for lands uh, within, the, within the secondary plan uh, in Manitick to build on. But they had actually owned those lands since the mid 90s. Uh, so those are types of things that, that we don't know. If, if people in this village start selling land to developers, but then continue to farm it, it's very possible. Uh, it's happened before. The lands, the, about 3,000 acres of land between Canada and Richmond were purchased by a developer about 12 to 15 years ago. They eventually went bankrupt and all that land is now for sale again. Um, but it's, it's, it does happen. The speculation does happen. Um, I think there's about 400 to 500 acres of land between Barhaven and Manitick that's owned by developers. Um, you know, it's, well, my, my idea would be that they never, they can never uh, build on it. They can, can never do anything with it. Uh, but that's, you know, again, I don't have that control for, for years. Um, so just another comment here. Um, about the traffic report. 
again, so, so I'm, there's not much point to get too into traffic in the site plan because the site plan isn't yet here. Um, if we do have a site plan, application submitted, then we'll go through that. So the community would have the opportunity to go through it. It's a very similar process to what we went through with the zoning. Um, the opportunity is there to bring it to committee and council. So site plan is something that usually gets approved at the staff level, uh, but a counselor does have the ability to withdraw the delegated authority and, and, um, and bring it to committee council for approval. So the, pro the process for the site plan, I think I've already committed to doing that if it comes in my time. Um, I mean, as of right now, there's no site plan application and it's still out for appeal. So that, that stuff there, I mean, it's, it, most of that discussion is incredibly hypothetical at this point. So there's not much, much to get into on that until there's actually an application in front of us. Um, question about how does this, the climate change plan allow for distribution center? It, it's, we can approve climate change master plan. We can't go and un, undo previous zoning. The zoning already allowed for a, waste, uh, for a distribution center. That's not, uh, you know, I've tried to, I've tried to, you know, say that uh, since the start, that this wasn't a question of whether or not a warehouse is a permitted use, it always was a permitted use. Uh, so the, the climate change master plan is about a lot of things, um, but the climate change master plan can't stop growth. The growth is coming. Like when we, the whole official plan, the intensification piece, urban boundary expansion, you know, ideally all your growth would be intensification, but it's not possible. It's, it's, the city doesn't have the capacity um, from a water and sewer perspective today to be able to do 100% intensification. Um, with the pushback that we get from communities, I mean, we had a three-story apartment building in Canada, heavily opposed within the community, uh, but that is a small scale intensification project. Uh, we would need to put, you know, hundreds of those in the city for the next 30 years in order to meet intensification targets that don't in, involve urban barrier expansion and urban barrier expansion is not really ideal for for climate change perspective for the for climate change master plan so it's a balance it's how do you how do you figure this all out how do you fit all the pieces together still allow for the growth that's coming and it's the growth is driven by the market the people are coming here uh, we see that i mean just look at the property values out here it's it's gotten a little bit out of hand Sorry, I'm just reading, trying to, I'm just trying to, when you see me pause, it's just because I'm reading uh, stuff in front of me. So I get a lot of questions about the, about the warehouse. I mean, it's permitted. I don't know why we can talk about it. I mean, if there was an application, I think I've said this a few times, if there was an application today to change that land from agriculture to industrial to print a warehouse, it would not go through. It would not come forward. It would not be supported by anyone at the city. It would not pass through council. End of story. Um, but you have a piece of land that permits this. And that's it. There is no other, there is no other scenario. If the land, if the land permits the use, the use is there. The reason why I showed you the village boundary and, and the various permissions inside that village today is because that residential development is permitted. It's permitted by the zoning, it's permitted by the secondary plan. So when growth comes forward, if you see a big development application in the future for residential growth, it's all permitted. Um, it's just a question of how it looks and how it fits and the road connections and the, and, and the pathway connections. Um, it's not a question of yes or no, because the planning stuff says it can go you're going to hear politicians in the future tell that they can, you, they can stop things. They're lying to you. Um, I don't, you know, I, I get, I know how this has gone in, for me <laughs> in the last little while. Um, I know how people feel, but this is just, the zoning permits this. And it's just a matter of what, not if, but what. And in my, you know, looking at it, knowing how, how things have gone elsewhere, knowing how development has gone elsewhere, the proposal that was put forward and the ability to change it and improve it uh, was better than planning with the, um, than sticking with the original plan. Uh, so again, um, if there's other questions, 
I'm happy to respond to those other questions, but most of the questions I'm getting currently would require me to say the same thing over and over again. And I don't think you want to hear that. So if you have, so here's just a question here, and this is a, a bit of a misnomer that happens quite a lot. Developers seem to be able to get things rezoned. Why can the residents not do the same? Well, one is you have to own land to rezone it. You can't rezone land that you don't own. So if residents wanted to buy land in this village and prevent development, you could do that. The only way a developer can get things rezoned for the most part is if the policy supports it. So when you see a rezoning app, a zoning amendment come forward, you'll see in the document, the planner has to show or the consultant has to show how it fits with the official plan and how it fits with the provincial policy statement. So these things have to be consistent with those things. Um, they have to be able to show that. If it's not consistent, it doesn't even get in front of the public. We get submissions all the time at the city where they come in, a developer will come in for a pre-consultation meeting with city staff and they present their plan and staff say, well, you don't fit this policy, this policy, this policy, it doesn't fit. They go away. You don't see those applications. So it's very rare that the community will ever see an application that's ever been denied by the city because they don't go anywhere. No one's going to spend money and submit an application if it's about $20,000 for a zoning amendment. It's about $25,000 for a official plan amendment. No one, no one's going to go through that process unless they have a pretty good idea that the policy fits what they're asking for. Again, no one's going to apply for those other three corners at Roger Stevens and the 416 because it's a non-starter. It's not going to go anywhere unless, unless policies change at the city. So council, future councils would have to change their policies to say, you know what, screw agricultural land, we're going to do this. The OFA has had a really good piece out on, on Twitter. They have a good story out um, talking about how much primary agricultural land is being lost to development. It's 175 acres a day. Um, that's the land. That's the, you know, we're, we're talking about land that was rezoned 25 years ago. It's unfortunate that it was rezoned, but the reality is it was rezoned. And I can't, I can't go back and change that. Um, I can't revert zoning back to agricultural because the owner, the property owner has rights. That shouldn't be a, a surprise to folks in the rural area. Property rights is a huge, um, is a huge reality for a lot of people out here and how they feel, but that cuts both ways that if you own land and you want to develop it, you can do that within reason, but you can do that. And if the policy already supports what you've, what you've done, um, what you're asking for, then there's no going back on that. So just a question about a sidewalk up to Craighurst. So that's not, okay, so it's a good question. It talks about would, would, um, would a sidewalk up to Craighurst be unlikely unless more development is added? So similar to uh, Church Street and extending the sidewalk down to Farmstead, it's not an issue of, of, um, of development or lack of development. It's an issue of, of space and drainage. So most of these, you know, there are storm sewers in the middle of, in the middle of North Gore, right down. I mean, you see it under Roger Stevens, you see it in a lot of our subdivisions and outlets. Um, they have outlets, drainage outlets, uh, under, under fourth line, there's storm sewers. But when you get further out of the core, you, you no longer have storm sewers. In fact, the storm sewers on Church Street end before you get to the Lanai stop sign at the top of the hill, which means there's no, there's no uh, storm sewers down to, to Farmstead. It's just the open ditches. If you put a sidewalk there, the drainage can't get get away. The drainage can't get to the ditch. It's blocked by the sidewalk. Um, and the road allowance on Church Street, because when we resurfaced it a few years ago, I tried to figure out, can we fit this? And let's work with our infrastructure folks. Can we find a better option for Farmstead to be able to get into, into the community? But the, the width of the road and the open ditches make it you know, near impossible. We were able to widen it just a smidge. And it's the same with, with Roger Stevens up to Craighurst is that you have this sidewalk that ends, but then it's, then it's the, the Oak Ridge apartments and there are no storm sewers there. The storm sewers up to, up to Perkins drive, but not past Perkins drive on Roger Stevens. Uh, so you don't have that ability to be able to get the water to run off 
in order to put the sidewalk in place to connect to to Craighurst, which is why we did the which is why we did the, the paved shoulder at least to provide something, you know, something better than a than a gravel shoulder. So that's an issue. That's an issue in a lot of rural communities. Um, right. So, question: Our voice is small. We're low in numbers. How do we convince urban councillors that we are untouchable and understand, respect, and maintain our choice to have a rural lifestyle? Well, that actually goes two ways because downtown downtown councillors feel that they're outnumbered. I mean, physically, they are outnumbered by suburban and rural councillors. And they feel they don't get their way uh, because they think that our voice, rural and suburban combined right now, is too strong. Um, reality is you have to get, your councillor needs to work with other members of council. Um, there's never been a vote. I've been on council for 10 and a half years. There's never been a vote that I've been a part of that has ever been rural versus urban. Never, not one. I've never had a 20 to four vote where the rural councillors were outnumbered and we didn't get something significant uh, because of that. There's always been a good cross section of how we, we do things. And, and it's, so it's, it's about representation. Um, you know, if you have, if you have a council that goes in there and is combative and, and doesn't try to work with, with their urban counterparts on anything, um, well, you're probably not going to get anything, uh, but in most cases, I mean, the agricultural, the city council did pass a motion uh, this time last year to protect all agricultural lands. Uh, I wrote it. Uh, it was moved by another councillor. It was passed unanimously at council, uh, but we did pass a motion and we went even further. We said, not only don't develop in the rural area, not expand, um, but don't put your storm water facilities. You don't, don't maximize your potential inside of your boundary and then go take a farm and stick a stormwater pond on it. You know, cause that's what, that's what developers try to do. They say, well, we, you know, it's not really urban development. It's just this, it's a stormwater pond. It's fine. Well, no, it takes over farmland and we're running out of space between the urban boundary and farmland. We tried to do a thing called a gold belt, but it ended up turning into, uh, into this thing that people felt we were, we were controlling their land rights. Uh, we weren't, we were showing with the gold belt proposal that was brought forward in the fall, we were trying to show that the city could actually grow until 2100 and not touch primary culture lands. Um, unfortunately, the messaging on it was poor. Uh, nobody wanted to really stand up for it and, uh, and it died, but it wasn't necessarily a, a new policy. The policies already exist. It was just a map. It was a map that said, here are the existing policies for agricultural lands, for rural natural featured lands, for uh, aggregate lands, so pits and quarries. These are where those fit. And they happen to form a ring around the urban boundary, but with land to spare in between it and the existing urban boundary. So growth could occur. We project to be at 1.4 million people by 2050. By 2100, we project to be at 2 million people. So where are they gonna go? And what that gold belt map was, was designed to do was to show that we could effectively protect agricultural land. And that includes the land south of Canada, south of Barhaven, south of Riverside South, all prime land. We could protect it and still grow the city to 2 million people by 2100. Um, we got landowner pushback, not from developers. Developers supported the gold belt. We got landowner pushback from individual landowners who currently sit and own that land and farm that land. They felt we were taking away their right to sell their land. That is not what we're doing because the policies already exist. If a speculator wants to come and buy your farm, they can do that. Is it my obligation to go and then turn that land to, to developable land? Absolutely not. Um, I've never supported flipping agricultural land to developable land and I won't. If someone wants to take the time to prove that it's not agricultural land through a variety of, you know, you can do, you can do soil studies. We have, we have our soil studies done. They aren't as, they're, they're more large in area. We, we look at 250 hectare parcels and we take that full, that full area and we look at that. It is possible that an individual landowner can come forward and say, well, this parcel isn't, here's the, here's the soil study. Here's the actual ground truth thing done. Um, that's possible. But council runs the risk of, of losing its entire integrity if they approve lands in Riverside South in September 
knowing that it's agricultural land. They shouldn't do it. And I'm trying to make sure they don't do it, but that's a tough one because um, in that case, I'm probably joining on. I don't really know if you guys care about this, but in that case in Riverside South, a number of councils are saying, well, we have LRT there. We paid to put LRT there. Um, so yeah, it's farmland, uh, but the LRT is there and it's our investment and we should maximize the investment by allowing growth there. The thing is the farmland was there before we approved the LRT line there. So I don't really understand for those counselors what they think they're seeing that they didn't know before. Um, and in fact, when they all voted to protect agricultural lands in May of 2020, uh, none of those lands or the train line changed between May of 2020 and October of 2020. In fact, it was all the same. The only thing that changed was that a few councillors got lobbied by the right developers. Um, so that's a bit of an uphill battle, but that is really a Riverside South issue. That is a North of Mantic issue. Uh, there's still a fine line uh, that we can draw, not fine line, there's a proper line that we can draw at Rideau Road. I'd like to draw it North of Rideau Road. Other councillors don't agree with me, uh, but that's something that I, I deal with. And that is not something that has to do with Ward 21. That's just a citywide uh, issue that, that, I, that I believe in. But um, sorry, sometimes I talk too much. Yeah, so again, I mean, I, I don't, I feel like if I'm repetitive, I sound disingenuous, but just the question I have here is about preserving character and that previous council has made a mistake in approving the lands that are subject to development in North Core for industrial lands. Um, you, know, you might be right. They might've made a mistake, but you can't easily undo those mistakes unless you own the land. And as long as that land is, is owned by someone who wants to develop it, it can be developed. I, I can't, I, I get it. I get the feeling. I think the the individual that wrote this to me, I think also opposed that change back then, um, but it did happen. And at that time, municipalities needed to identify lands. Um, Goulburn Township did so in Richmond. Uh, Rio Township chose North Court to stick industrial lands. And unfortunately they chose a piece of agricultural land. Um, and, you know, it wasn't developed over all those years. So now we have what we have today. Um, all right. And then I'll just do one last question. It's almost eight o'clock. So I'll let you people go, but just, uh, just again, if, if anyone wanted to, to watch this, if anyone wanted to hear this conversation, I mean, it's all recorded again, we'll post it on our YouTube channel. Uh, so you can go back and look at it again. Uh, we did do, I have done, um, again, a couple of podcasts on the subjects today. So I did do a, a podcast fully talking about Cranberry Creek and the, and municipal drainage in the area. And I did a podcast on 1966 Roger Stevens Drive. And I also did a podcast on the secondary plan and talking about that. So I've kind of covered this stuff too in that, uh, but it's also nice to do it in a visual format where you can actually you know, see some of the pictures that we're talking about and some of the growth potential, even though it's not really gonna be realized anytime soon. So the final question is just any plans for retirement residences and what can we as a community do to encourage this? So again, this, I spoke to a, uh, to a developer who's developed these types of facilities in the rural area, and they have done it on, on primarily on, on public services. Um, they have looked at North Corps. you know, what's, what's the possibility? What's the potential? It's not impossible. You know, the, there are two, there are two such facilities uh, on Mantic station road that have been developed in, you know, large retirement residence communities that have been developed on, on private services. Um, so it is possible. Um, I've only had the one, the one prospective developer ever speak to me. And again, they're a local, they're actually a local builder. Um, they're a local landowner, sorry, that works with a, with a development firm and, 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 uh, and does certain things like that in other communities. Um, they've built in nearby in Kempville and whatnot. Um, so, you know, I think there's a demand for retirement residents. We see it uh, in Mantic, not affordable, uh, but we see it in Mantic and we see it uh, more on the affordable side in Richmond. Um, now those are both on, on full water and sewer. So as a community to encourage it, I mean, ultimately, you know, the, the secondary plan, you know, permits it. The zoning in certain areas would permit it but you need, you need that, 
I guess that desire from a from a landowner, from a builder to come in and, and, and do it and put that investment in. The tough thing is knowing that you need to go a bit more on the servicing runs the risk of it not being incredibly affordable. Um, but you know, it would be a good fit. You know, I'm not sure everyone would agree with that because larger buildings aren't always uh, popular. But I do think there's there's an element of demand in, in a community like North Cork uh, for retirement residents, but right now there's not one on the horizon. Not that it could be done though. Um, and then just so I'll ask the one last question, any plans on paving Dilworth? So I did go through the list of, I, I assume you mean the, the repaving of Dilworth, not the gravel portion of Dilworth. But um, I did go through the list of projects that are slated for renewal in the coming, the next three years or so. Dilworth is not on it. I do have a meeting. You aren't the first to raise it. Uh, so Dilworth, as it runs from Rita Valley Drive, which was resurfaced uh, not that long ago, Rita Valley Drive South, all the way down to, to Baxter. Uh, but Dilworth, from that point, from the river, all the way over to uh, the 416 and eventually to Fourth Line Road, uh, is not currently on any plans for renewal. Um, I have a meeting with, with our infrastructure services staff later this month uh, to talk about the next five-year plan and you know, what we're doing in 2021, 2022 and beyond. And certainly I'll raise, you know, Dilworth because what they do is they go out and they, they'll go out and review these roads every couple of years. They'll come back out and they'll see. And then certainly um, comments from, from residents to me and I pass it on to council to, to, uh, to city staff and they go out and they review and they do an assessment. I mean, some roads deteriorate faster than others. Just look at fourth line road, south of, uh, south of the village. It was resurfaced in 2010 and it looks like it's 50 years old. Um, Malakoff Road. Uh, so I mentioned Malakoff as well. Uh, so Malakoff, obviously the part between Roger Stevens and Century was resurfaced last year. The part between Roger Stevens and Cowell, as far as I know, was done in the mid 2000s. South of Cowell is atrocious um, and it is slated for renewal, but unfortunately it's still two or three years away. Um, I, I, that, that's one that's been a problem for years. And it's, uh, but it is, it is on, it is finally on a schedule and we're putting the money uh, in the budget to make sure that those roads don't fall off that two other, that, you know, other roads don't become a priorities over roads like Malakoff. It's tough because we obviously, you know, roads like, let's say Roger Stevens a couple of years ago, it's a lot higher traffic volume. Um, so roads like Malakoff end up falling down. Uh, but because we're trying to put more money every single year into renewal, roads like Malakoff can come back on the list and actually get done. So that's that. Again, if there's any other questions that anyone has, uh, by all means, you know, send me uh, send me an email, scott.moffitt.ca. Uh, this, say it again, this video will be available uh, to watch again. And we have another meeting coming up uh, next Tuesday, May 18th, to deal with Richmond. And so we've, we've already done one on Munster. We did one uh, for Manatic. We have a Richmond one coming up. But I appreciate all the questions here today. I appreciate the comments and happy to address anything else via email or social media, however you'd like. Uh, but thank you so much for your time tonight and I hope you uh, enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you.